All right, welcome to module four, week six. We're gonna talk about management technical rationality. By this moment, you should be working hard already on your papers. Hopefully we've already discussed what you wanna work on. If not, by now, let me know, up to you. In the meantime, as we probably could guess that sustainability can only really be achieved in part because we're using best practices. It's hard to achieve sustainable tourism if we're not using at least good practices. See, here would be an example of a not good practice. So in this lecture, we're gonna talk about technical rationality and management by conditions um, for, for managing visitors. Now, you may have heard about the idea of technical rationality because it was I talked about in chapter two of my book, along with rational comprehensive planning. So I'm kind of assuming that you've already seen that chapter and you already understand the plus world and the dice world and how excuse me, how paradigms uh, change. So I'm not going to go over that very much. Um, and, it's, and actually the starting of technical rationality begins on page 23 of the book. So anyway, this idea of technical rationality, uh, it arose during the Enlightenment period in Western Europe. Uh, and we talked about modernism in an earlier lecture. And the forefathers of this were people like Galileo, Descartes, Hobbes, Bacon, Newton, Locke, Rousseau, and uh, Jefferson in the United States. So all these guys had a belief in the power of the mind, right? And it was based on the power of the mind and the use of science and technology that could lead to social mobility. And this is very different from what it was before this period, before the Enlightenment, during the Middle Ages, when you are born into a certain station or a certain caste, whether that be royalty or whether that be a peasant or a serf, and there you will stay for the rest of your life, just like your parents before you and just like your children after you. So when the enlightenment came along and these guys started thinking, well, hey, I don't wanna be born into a caste that I can never leave. I don't wanna to have to be born into a belief system that I can never change or deny or question. So they came up with this new approach to social mobility. Granted, they all had the luxury of being high born. So they uh, had the opportunity to use their minds and uh, this modernism and rationality eventually became technical rationality. And that was a belief system that professionals could basically perfect society, right? They could perfect society through the use of science. And they would use uh, professionals themselves as the vehicle for scientific knowledge that comes out of academia. In other words, the professionals working in the field would identify technical problems and they would refer that to the academics at the universities who would then solve those problems, at least in academic terms, take those solutions, give them back to the professionals who would then apply them uh, in the field. So looking more towards protected areas, the professionals identified the needs for better planning in protected areas the academics produced lots of different planning and management frameworks, and then the professionals tried to apply them in the field. Now, this approach works very well for technical problems that have discrete solutions. I mean, just think of chess, for example, where the solution to this problem is a checkmate. It's a clear stopping point. There's no doubt when the chess match is over. And there are a lot of problems that we have in life that are very much like this. For example, building a bridge, right? We need, we know how long the bridge needs to be. We know the force that it needs to maintain. We know all the variables that are involved. So once that bridge is built and works, problem solved. Yeah, this may also be improving a savings in a park budget, building a first aid station in a park, improving the traffic flow along a road are, are all technical solutions with clear stopping points or clear solutions. In short, closed systems 
that is where we can quantify all the variables like building a bridge or improving the flow on a road um, are very appropriate for this kind of technical rational approach because we basically can calculate or solve these technical problems in their relatively black and white context. So for certain things and inventing new technologies, computers, things like that, um, this technical rational approach, this relationship between professionals and academics uh, can result in great things. And in fact, all around us, we have the results of that kind of thinking, the technologies and the comforts um, that we live and that we use uh, every day. But this approach does not work so well with messy social problems, with open systems where we don't know what all the variables are and the variables are connected in all kinds of strange ways. Um, for example, in conflict situation among stakeholders, here we have some locals trying to get to a beach, passing along a park maintenance road that wasn't designed for them. This is a conflict between users and, and managers in this case. Um, open systems are oftentimes systems of systems. The interior and exterior dimensions, they're just mixed together in ways that are pretty much impossible to reproduce under controlled situations. You know, science likes to be able to reproduce a phenomena in controlled laboratory situations. You can't do that here. You can't model this kind of situation uh, on a computer such as you can when you're building a bridge. So what does that mean with complex social messy problems? It means the only way to resolve them is to actually practice with real people in real life in real time. She can't do it in a laboratory. Another big problem is that the problems themselves are not easy to define, or maybe even impossible to define. Consider poaching, for example. Now, this how do you define the problem of poaching? It could be an economic problem, right? Because their their horns are being sold on the market. It could be an education problem because people just aren't aware of the damage that poaching causes. It could be a cultural problem because culture allows it to happen. Or maybe it's a wildlife problem and we need to manage the rhinos instead of the people. No matter how you define poaching, whether it's an economic, educational, cultural, wildlife, or some other problem, each one, of whatever you choose, will give you a different strategy, totally different strategy. And... Um, that makes it quite complicated because you really won't know until you try the strategy. The same problems, there are quite a few different kinds of problems that afflict protected areas that fall into this category, whether it's poverty outside of a park, whether it's natural resource extraction like this oil facility in a Yasuni National Park in Ecuador. It could be over tourism, another complex social phenomenon where some people benefit and other people don't. And those who benefit don't even see over tourism. They see enough or even not enough tourism. Climate change too is also drives animals outside of parks into nearby villages. Yet again, a complex problem which could be defined environmentally, socially, culturally, economically, in lots of different ways. And as I mentioned in the book, the technical rationality leads to rational comprehensive planning. That is planning based on this rational technical approach. You obviously see the rational in the name, rational comprehensive planning. Comprehensive means looking at all sorts of different alternatives or options and then choosing the optimal one. What's particularly interested in which you'll find on page 24 and 25 is the similarity between the planning process, rational comprehensive planning, and creating a scientific study, where both of them go largely through the same steps. For example, first you have to frame problems, whether it's a planner or whether it's a study. Then you have to find extraordinary funding. It usually doesn't come out of your normal budget. Then you have to design a methodology to study or a methodology to plan. You define your objectives of your study, the objectives in your plan. Well, oftentimes they are park objectives, but then the plan itself has objectives. Uh, in both cases, you collect data, oftentimes baseline data, whether it's a study 
or whether you're doing your diagnosis or uh, in your plan first. And in both cases, you have to analyze that data. Then you produce recommendations or in the case of a plan, strategies to achieve your objectives. In both cases, you write up a first draft of the document. In both cases, you submit to peer review. In the case of a plan, the peer review aren't necessarily other academics, but you send it to the public for comment or for other stakeholders for comment. And when you're doing a scientific study, you send it to the reviewers in a journal. Uh, in both cases, they send their comments. You integrate some of those comments or a lot of those comments to write up a second draft. Then you seek approval, whether it be from the journal or approval from those powers, such as a government agency, in the case of a protected area. Then you publish it. Publish it in the journal, or you publish your plan. And usually in both cases, you hope someone else implements, because typically the planners are not the implementers. So the planners have no implementation power. And oftentimes the implementers aren't that involved in the planning either. So interesting how those who plan are, and those who implement are different sets of people very oftentimes. So as you probably already know, there are lots of technical, rational planning and management models. Uh, one of the readings for this week is Appendix D of Eagles, McCools, and Haynes, which compares like five different management models, most of which you probably already heard of, if not in this course, in the planning course, heard of carrying capacity, VERP, Recreational Opportunity Spectrum, Ross, Limits of Acceptable Change, LAC, VIM, TOM, VAMP, Open Standards of Conservation Practice. All of these different frameworks have emerged out of technical rationality. They vary a little bit differently, but they're all methodical. They're scientific. They tend to try to quant quantify um, in, in very step-by-step -step fashion. The video by Haley that I signed for this week is also a good example of planning. The way she presents planning is from a technical, rational, or comprehensive, rational planning perspective. So even though it's an interesting video, I shared that with you because you can see that perspective behind her explanation of planning. She looks at only the technical side and doesn't look at it into the social process side, which we'll talk about in a moment. So you might remember from a previous video that in response to the ills or defects or problems caused by modernism emerged postmodernism, largely in the 1960s to try to address those weaknesses. What are some of those weaknesses, just to remind you again? Well, modernism, technical rationality promotes competition, you know, to see who can move up in the social mobility and who can produce the best solutions for society and the competition which is now expressed oftentimes in modern sports and in capitalism and in the market um, those who can't compete they lose so the weak almost always lose they're oftentimes even excluded from the game right from the beginning not because modernists are necessarily racist but because what they do is they prioritize those who have the faculties and the abilities and the resources to compete and move forward. Modernism, such as capitalism, which is an example of modernism, sees nature as merely resources for economic and development processes. These natural resources, notice, notice the word resource is a very economic term, they have no spiritual, cultural, or interior value beyond their being an input into an economic process. And because modernist and science are, is empirical, has a focus on physicalism or materialism, just the, the physical world, people have said that it disenchants the world by taking out spirituality, by taking out interiority, divinity, things that have been so important for all of human history um, and, and religion, no longer important in the modern mind. And all phenomena that cannot be understood by empirical science are said by these scientists to not exist. This is why Marx said religion is the opium of the masses, right? So modern science denies the wisdom of the ancestors 
It ridicules a belief in the afterlife for reincarnation. And it says experiences of ghosts, UFOs, spirits, things that are oftentimes very important at cultural heritage sites don't exist. Even God is regarded as a distraction from real life challenges. So those are some of the problems of modernism. And we did talk about the good things of modernism as well, all the technologies and things that they've given us and science and rationality. But in response to the problems has arose the new values of postmodernism, which is very important for where we're going in management, in protected areas and tourism. For example, what are some of the values of postmodernism? Well, multiculturalism, right? Trying to bring in many different cultures and not just a dominant Western white male culture. We have uh, giving voice to the voiceless, right? Remember all those who can't compete in the game of modern capitalism, their voices disappear or they're suppressed. Well, modern and postmodernists want to give voice back to those who had been previously voiceless. Postmodernism believes that everyone's truth is equally valuable. Because before, only the winner's truth was the one that was valued. In this course, this idea is called relativism, where truth is relative to the perspective of every different perspective. Uh, this postmodernism brings back interiority, you know, things that are intangible that are inside us. Uh, love and the new spirituality, right? These aren't things that empirical science measures or thus recognizes. Then we have holism too. Postmodernism sees many different aspects, interior and exterior, spiritual and not an empirical. Uh, many of the aspects that have been excluded or never recognized in the first place um, in modernism. Postmodernists understand that our connection to nature is far more than just physical, that it's spiritual, it's related to our health and our psychology. So our interaction with nature is far greater. And thus people's subjective values are very important. You know, what people think and feel up inside their, their minds is a very important factor in influencing reality, defining problems and solutions, which for the modernists, what you think and feel, or especially what you feel, isn't important. Um, the postmodernists realize that the world is much more complex and interconnected. In short, it's a dice world, not the plus world. And you'll notice that most of the causes, the, the good causes and the United Nations frameworks that we see today reflect postmodern values. I mean, the UN frameworks, there's frameworks on the rights of children, the rights of immigrants, the rights of animals, and even landscapes, rights of women, rights of LGBTQ+, rights of prisoners of war, there's biodiversity conservation, intangible heritage management, peace, anti-war, etc. All of these ideas are postmodern ideas that have emerged largely in response to the ills of modernism. Now, as you know, in modernism, in the modern world, economic growth is key. The idea is if there's more growth, then more development will occur and more progress will occur on our route to perfecting society. So economic growth is always good. Natural resources are always our necessary input for that growth to occur. So we're talking about all of the economy here, but now let's focus back down on tourism where tourism growth is also good because the more tourism growth, according to the modernist thought, there'll be more development in those communities and those countries where tourism occurs. Growth is good. And to promote the growth of tourism, it is important to give industry and the market everything that it desires and wants. You know, when there are not enough roads and parks, we build more roads so that more people can come in. We build more trails so that more people can come in and different kinds of people can come in. We need to, and of course, if more people come into our parks, then we need to have more and better bathrooms. And of course, not everyone is going to want to bring their own food. So we're going to have to build more restaurants for them and different kinds of restaurants too, for different kinds of visitors. 
they're going to have to have bigger souvenir shops, of course, because people are going to want to buy lots of different kinds of souvenirs. And of course, it, that generates more income as well. More designated selfie space stations, more all kinds of things that the tourism wants. In short, we could say that this is a demand-driven model. Whatever the industry and whatever tourists demand, we try to give it to them. I mean, we don't always have enough money, but we make our best effort to try and offer this increasing amount of services so that ultimately everybody has a better experience. Now, this demand-driven model makes a lot of sense in the tourism industry, for example, hotels, but one has to question whether this demand model is as appropriate in, natural, in protected areas and heritage sites, because heritage sites are usually managed by not-for-profits, governments, sometimes for-profits, but they have other, other objectives. Their objectives are not just to keep growing or to bring in more money or to perfect society. They have objectives to protect their heritage and provide a full range of services to many different kinds of users, many of which aren't even monetary um, at all. So this demand model then perhaps doesn't work in the context of the places of destinations where we oftentimes want to have tourism. Now, fortunately, some of the frameworks that are that emerged out of technical rationality do have seeds of postmodernism and do have seeds of foreshadows of another model that might be more appropriate in our heritage areas. But what are some of these seeds of postmodernism? Well, adaptive management, for example, emphasizes continuous learning in a changing world. Because remember, in a plus world, the S stands for static or stable. So adaptive management doesn't in, uh, infer or assume the world is stable and static. The limits of acceptable change recognizes the importance of su the subjective aspect or human values in resolving conflicts, uh, conflicts that cannot be objectively solved, right? It requires managing people's different values. It also requires setting limits of acceptable change and what is acceptable is very often a subjective matter. The recreation opportunity spectrum, Ross, understands that there are varying conditions that contribute to different kinds of experiences and not all kind of visitors have or want the same kind of experiences. And carrying capacity, well, it doesn't contribute anything to postmodern thought, so we won't talk about that. But anyway, so based on these other uh, frameworks that do have some new ways of thinking, as well as the old ways, a whole new framework has been emerging in the United States. And this is called the Interagency Visitor Use Management Framework. Essentially, what happened was sometime around 2011 or 2010, there were and still are six U.S land management agencies that manage different kinds of lands and receive visitors. And you can see their logos up there. The U.S. National Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service, the uh, Corps of Army Engineers, and NOAA for marine sanctuaries. They all got together, having realized that they're speaking different vocabularies and using different management frameworks that aren't really compatible. And that can cause a lot of conflicts. Just imagine how many national parks are butting up against forests, national forests. As soon as you cross that line, managers are now using different vocabularies and different concepts to try to manage visitors. So it wasn't very efficient. So the different agencies got together and they created first the Interagency Visitor Use Management Council, which several years later, around in 2016, finally had consolidated their new integrated framework called the, as I mentioned, the Interagency Visitor Use Management Framework and published a series of manuals and things. And it's now being applied in the United States and is just barely leaking outside the United States. For example, they don't have any materials uh, in Spanish. So this is a model 
that's different from the demand model. In this case, the basic idea is premised on desired conditions. This is where a stakeholder community ideally comes together and through consensus, they just determine the desired conditions of sites at different scales. Could be a very small local site like a visitor center, or it could be the entire national park or both. Effectively, what they're doing is they're creating a shared vision of a place. And with that shared vision, they have a target. They can create objectives. They know what they want to create and they know where to set their limits of acceptable change. So this is the opposite of the demand model, even though tourism is still a stakeholder in the desired conditions model. It's one of the many stakeholders at the table coming up with this consensus-based shared vision. Now, it's very interesting because in the development world, one of the ways to control growth is to have objectives and have a shared vision of the world you want to create or the site you want to have before growth gets out of control, before tourism goes crazy. In this sense, the developers are using tourism as a tool to get to where they want to be. They're using tourism as a tool to achieve the desired conditions, the shared vision. But when there is no vision and there are no objectives about what we want to create together, then the community becomes a tool for tourism to do what it wants. I think this is really important. Once again, with a vision and objectives, tourism is a development tool, sustainable tourism even better. When there is no vision and objectives, then the community is an input. The community is the tool for tourism to do what it wants. And unfortunately, I think we have far more examples of the latter than we do of the former. Now, along this idea of desired conditions, you know, we're quite accustomed in planning and the business world to think of visions as short statements that are need to be attractive, right? That's what we're told. You want to have a short vision statement that you can take in very quickly and easily. And here's an example of a very famous park, Yellowstone National Park. The world's first national park was set up as a public pleasuring ground to share the wonders and preserve and protect the scenery, cultural heritage, wildlife, ecological, geological systems and processes in their natural conditions for the benefit and enjoyment of present and future generations. Well, even for the short vision statement, the idea of a vision is to create something in the future that you want to be able to, to become versus a mission which tells us what you want to do or what you are doing. I would say this is actually a mission statement and not a vision. But whether that's the case or not, I also refer to Peter Senge, who is a guru in the business literature. And he makes the point that a vision statement is only useful insofar as its ability to mobilize resources. So if the vision doesn't inspire folks enough to become volunteers, to join your organization, to make donations, then it's basically a useful, a useless sentence. So short statements are short for promotional reasons, but if they don't mobilize resources, then they are failing even that singular function. So there is an alternative idea of a vision. It's not promotional. It is a planning tool, and that's a detailed vision, a detailed vision that derives out of a consensus process, oftentimes over weeks and months, often throughout an entire planning process, you're gradually adding new vision details about a national park. For example, you start out maybe with a big vision, and then over time, you're talking about your visitor center, and then you're talking about your visitor experiences that you want to have, and then the role in the national park system. So every time these discussions occur throughout a planning process, you're adding more and more details to the overall vision. So here is a vision of Pico Bonito National Park. This is actually the very first park back in the late 90s that my organization began working with in the public use planning sphere. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, not necessary. I highlighted a few aspects, which would be concrete 
details, desired conditions within this overall vision. For one, it says there is a particular trail that should be a top-notch trail. Uh, and then this place has Honduras, because Pico Bonito is on the coast of Honduras. His largest animal rescue center farther down says, True People's Park, not only because it is easily accessible to the masses, but also because it gives up the concept of a super ministry, that is, it tries to control everything by itself a, a long time and shares the responsibility of management with the private sector and other people who live around the park. Farther down, it says, uh, people will consider Pico Bonito to be the most professional park in Honduras with the help of uniforms, a snappy logo, a good public image, complemented by its long known reputation among donors and government as one of the most productive and non no nonsense NGOs in the country because it's run by a nonprofit, which is how they do things uh, in Honduras. So what you can see here is that there's a lot of concrete details, desired conditions about the future. That is part of the vision of the park that came out of its public use planning process. So this is not a new idea of desired conditions, but oftentimes we don't do that in planning. We certainly don't do that in the vision. I mean, in the vision of Yellowstone, there's no specific concrete vision details at all. It's practically not even about the future at all. All it is is describing the present and the past. If you look at it, it says it was set aside to do this, this. So that's the past. There's nothing to do with the vision at all. Um, to share the wonders, culture, process, conditions. As a matter of fact, the entire vision statement is about the past. <laughs> I didn't even realize that when I chose this example at the beginning. So sorry, Yellowstone. It's a pretty bad vision statement. Anyway, getting back. So to the desired conditions. So the whole framework of the interagency management visitors, of course, it has multiple steps and stages, which I'm not going to go through, although I, I did give you the manual in the reading. I'm just going to highlight the main aspects of it, the ones that we're going to focus on. And of course, desired conditions is fundamental. You need to have this shared vision of a site a detailed vision of the site or of the larger park, or both, whatever scales you happen to be working on. Once you know those desired conditions, the specific conditions, then uh, that, come, that ideally come through a community consensus, which is postmodern, then you want to operationalize that shared vision with some modernist tools. So we use indicators and thresholds. We know what the desired condition is, and I'll give you examples in a moment. Then we set the indicator so we know how to measure that desired condition. Then we set the threshold. You know, what is our target? What is our maximum? What is our limit of acceptable change for the condition that the indicator is measuring? Then we want to have visitor use management strategies, right? So that both to prevent the condition from going beyond our limit of acceptable change or to bring it back down if it's already gone beyond it. So we need preventative and corrective visitor management strategies. And of course, you can use these desired conditions, indicators, and thresholds for non-visitor related elements as well, such as conservation, you know, for target species. What is the um, desired condition for a population of eagles? Right. Well, you might determine through both scientific and non-scientific ways that it's a uh, hundred individuals per hundred square miles. I know nothing about the correct population of, of eagles. So the indicator would be the number of individuals per square mile. And then the threshold would be a minimum of a hundred individuals per square mile. If you already, if you have more than a hundred, then you want to try to make preventative measures. So it stays above a hundred. If you have less than 100 now, then you're going to have to take corrective measures to increase the population. So this, pro this process works for um, all kinds of things and not just visitor-related, tourism-related issues. And then once we know uh, what our different strategies could be, uh, we know our indicators and thresholds, we set up a monitoring strategy right, so that we know uh, where we are, what our baseline is, and how it's changing over time. So this whole process is still couched in an adaptive management 
context. If you take these steps, you can fold them into a circle and you see you have a very similar adaptive management or a learning cycle. But what's interesting about the adaptive management learning cycle is that it can be modernist or postmodernist. It's modernist when learning is just assumed and it doesn't consider the collective interior quadrant, that is, the organizational culture. It becomes postmodernist when you do consider the interior aspect of a group. Um, because learning doesn't happen at an organizational level or even at an individual level, just automatically by exposing someone to it, data. I think we've all had that experience. So for the postmodernists, and there's a whole field called um, organizational learning, where they look in large measure, but not only in the lower left quadrant, but also in the other quadrants. So what are some things that, just to give you an idea, that a true learning organizational culture would have to have in order for learning to occur, in order for adaptive management to be effective. For example, mistakes and errors need to be seen as learning opportunities to harvest. If you're punished for not achieving your objectives or you're punished um, for, for making mistakes, then everyone's gonna be fearful of making any mistakes or admitting their mistakes and those opportunities to learn will be lost. Leaders need to model learning from errors because if the leaders do it, then that means everybody else can do it as well. And when a leader admits to making a mistake, they're making themselves vulnerable and more authentic. And that creates a safe space for other others. And there needs to be a safe space for errors and vulnerability. No one's going to admit they made a mistake if they're going to be laughed at or, or ridiculed. If they, if they have to, if the real truths are only spoken in the bathrooms between employees, there needs to be budget for learning, specific budgets, and it's not just trainings, although training is part of it. The organization has to have a mechanism for rec re recording institutional learning, documenting so that the people who learn when they leave the organization don't bring all the learning with them. There need to be specific uh, learning champions, right? Some people who are leading, not necessarily the leaders, I did say leading, but people who are really showing um, how learning culture can work. Creating incentives and rewards for learning. Maybe you actually reward people for making mistakes and turning those mistakes into improvements. Uh, anyway, the lack of these is why monitoring, evaluation, and adaptive management so often fail in modernist workplaces. So anyway, I just wanted to give that aside that adaptive management can be modernist or can be postmodernist, depending or not whether it looks at the interior collective, probably interior individual aspects as well. So now I'm going to give you a case study of a project that I worked on from 2019 to 2024. We just finished it in Argentina um, with the National Park Service, which the George Wright Society and some universities, excuse me, as well as the uh, American Embassy in Buenos Aires and the State Department. And that was to work with five parks, national parks from Argentina and introducing the concept of the interagency visitor use management framework to see if it could possibly work outside the United States in a different culture. So in each of these five parks, I'm only going to show you um, Parque Nacional Monte Leon, uh, which is on the southern Patagonia, the Atlantic side, where they actually have penguins. It's actually the only place in the world where pumas eat penguins. But in any event, uh, and here we introduce this idea of desired conditions. And um, one important point that we did share, a political benefit of this approach, is that if there is community consensus and the desired conditions don't just come from the desktop of technical park staff, then the decisions are more resilient. They're more resilient to corruption, to changes in government, to changing priorities from chasing money you know, because the whole community, or at least a good part of the community, has backed them. 
and one a new director at a park can't simply change them without facing that political pressure. Anyway, that's an aside. So now let me share, show you with some of these examples. This is just a picture that it's a coastal park and it has a large intertidal zone. There's a cormorant uh, colony there. And where the park chose to apply this methodology was at a campground very near the beach. You can see the campsites here, the kind of environment that it's in. Uh, there's no trees, it's a step area. Uh, people drive their cars right up to the campsites. One of the problems I identified was wind erosion. You can see that uh, where this fire pit, well, it's not really a fire pit, but for you uh, do your grilling, the base is being exposed because the soil around it is being blown away. And um, it's actually making it harder because people who are shorter have a hard time reaching <laughs> higher up because it's farther from the ground. So from this campsite then, you can get on your bike or walk right to the beach. This picture is taken from the campsite looking out towards the uh, ocean. And during low tide, there's this beautiful intertidal zone where you can walk out, see different kinds of uh, mollusks and things and different kinds of birds that you obviously can't see during high tide. And here's a couple of our teammates. Um, one of our teammates working with the U.S. Embassy and the park director on the right. And tourists go down there and it's all kinds of fun stuff. So for this relatively small site compared to the full size of the park is where they decided to do it. And after a couple rounds, they came up with their con desired condition statement. This one I will read in full. Visitors can enjoy three environments present in the protected area, the steppe, coast, and sea, without encountering disturbances caused by waste. Tourists, like trash, for example, tourist activity does not interfere with keeping the biodiversity of these environments protected. In the camping area, visitors carry out different activities, such as camping, picnics, barbecues, walks along the beach at low tide, wildlife watching, swimming in the sea, and contemplating the great beauty and spectacular scenery of the area. The services and conditions in the camping area have adequate facilities and amenities for visitors to enjoy. Recreational use is ordered, meaning planned, and located in the area subject to management guidelines. When visitors camp, they have a feeling of being in a wild place with little presence of other people. Accessibility to the coast is adequate to avoid accidents and to obtain the necessary recommendations for enjoying the beach without disturbing the environment. Now, could this have been written better? Yeah, probably, but this was done by the park staff with two drafts. So there are several different conditions mentioned in this paragraph. We're gonna pull one out and work with it, although they did work with several conditions throughout the whole activity. So here we're gonna work with, when visitors camp, they have a feeling of being in a wild place with little presence of other people. That feeling is the condition that they're shooting for in this campsite. So we're gonna start developing that feeling uh, right now. You can see our team is talking with the park staff uh, as they go about the staff, the planning staff. We visited the site to get a feel for what it was in the current moment to see what the current conditions were. And now we use, once again, our modernist tools to operationalize this desired condition. Remember, once again, it's indicators, thresholds, and monitoring. So with that condition in mind, what are the indicators? And this is where the experience of the technical team from the United States helped because we were able to offer different indicators that are used in, in, in the United States and are manageable. And then they would choose. So a number of interactions with other people during the day in a camping area. So the more interactions you have, the less isolated the higher and the greater the presence of feeling that you're going to feel and less wild. Or the number of occasions which campers hear other people each day in the camping area. So the number of audible encounters. The more you hear people, obviously the less uh, wild and natural it's going to, your experience is going to be. 
So if those are our two indicators, it doesn't tell you how many interactions or how many occasions, because that's the next step, that's the threshold. So no more than five interactions with people throughout the day in the camping area. And they define an interaction as a conversation of three or more minutes. I would probably make it a lot less time, but that was their decision. And no more than 10 occasions in which campers hear other people per day in the camping area. So it doesn't count at the beach or in the service part of the area, but this is just in the camping area itself. How do you determine these thresholds? It's a combination of research and intuition and experience. So you may use survey data to come up with these numbers. Uh, you may interview people. Um, you may decide based on your own experience what you think those should be. And this is your starting point. You, through trial and error, you may modify these thresholds. Then you come up with a monitoring strategy for each of these indicators. Once a month, rangers observe the number of sightings of other people or the number of times other people are heard per day. So the rangers actually go in there and measure through their own observation the number. Or once a month, rangers interview visitors about the number of sightings of other people and sounds heard. So the second monitoring strategy is through visitor recall, where we ask the visitors, which is much quicker than actually spending time, but might be less accurate. So then once we have our threshold set, then, and our monitoring set, we also now want to know um, what our strategies will be preventative and our corrective strategies. Preventative, if we're underneath those thresholds, corrected, corrective, if we are already beyond them. So just to give you some example, we can add signs and information about the power of nature and natural sounds to emphasize the importance of staying quiet. Um, we can ask people as a policy um, to limit their interaction with other campers. We can maintain a low number of campsites to favor natural sounds. So if the campsites are more distributed, um, we're more likely to favor natural sounds and less human sounds. The ranger can ask the visitors to keep quiet and not approach other campsites. Again, this is another strategy. The speakers and radios can be prohibited, although headphones are acceptable, right? So that people don't play music too loudly. You can build sound barriers between campsites to improve privacy. Move campsites farther away from others than they already are now. So the one above it was maintain a low density. And the, uh, the one below it, corrective, is to, in, to lower the current density. So you might notice uh, from a visitor management perspective that unlike carrying capacity, which assumes there's really only one strategy, and that's limiting access, managers, in fact, have many tools in their toolbox to achieve sustainable tourism to achieve the desired conditions. And I should also note that desired conditions can be economic. Like I said, you can use the system across many different areas, cultural and social, right? not just necessarily visitor related. But since we're talking about tourism in this course, we stick with the visitor related ones. So as I was saying, managers have many different tools in their toolbox. Um, the actual uh, handbook from the Interagency Visitor Use Management Framework talks about eight different management strategies, including management of the type of, of activities, the timing, the locations, the distribution of use, of behaviors, attitudes, expectations of visitors, and increasing the supply and ability of sites to handle the use. Anyway, I want to talk about a, a simpler system that we use in Argentina, and I'm not actually sure if it's specifically mentioned in the handbook or not, but it's very useful. So you see here, there's three different columns, information, education, policies, and regulation, infrastructure, and landscape. And they're actually ordered along a certain spectrum. Just take a one look to see if you can, a few seconds, think if you see how they're being ordered from most or from least to most. Okay. The spectrum from least to most, if you haven't seen it, is really increasing intervention, right? Information and education, 
is the lowest level of intervention. Um, it's the cheapest, it's the quickest. And then if that doesn't work, then you might add on policies and regulations, which are heavier handed, uh, can be more expensive, both for the visitors and the managers themselves, because oftentimes creating new policies and regulations requires a large process. Policies and regulations may also require the third level, which is infrastructure and landscape modifications, right? This is the most permanent, the hardest, uh, oftentimes the most expensive to do is to modify the infrastructure and landscape if the previous two levels don't work. So let's just give some more examples of these different levels. Information and education, right? Uh, interpretation and just information, signs, brochures, videos, uh, websites, managing expectations, informing people about the rules, uh, promoting the site, training personnel so that they can better manage visitors. Um, guards are enforcing regulations by such as by asking people to remain silent, silent or stay on the trail, which is pretty similar to informing about the rules. Um, conducting surveys for visitor, visitor feedback. So it's information the park can use to better manage. Uh, use of volunteers to help visitors. It's just looking at some of these pictures to give you an example. The upper right corner is once again the park director of Monteleon while we were walking with her out to the penguin colony. We actually ran into two visitors who were off the trail. She went into uh, director mode and she was kindly informing them that they need to stay on the trail, otherwise they'll be hurting the vegetation. Underneath that comes from a national park here in Costa Rica, which you can't see too well, but right around in the upper left side, there's a person sitting down in blue. That's a University of Costa Rica student, volunteer. They're deployed around the main trails to inform visitors about both the rules, natural history, and any other information that they want. So it's a great example of information education. In the middle, we see the training of Colombian National Park guides in interpretation and visitor tourist training. And in the lower right, we see uh, Iguazu National Park in Argentina, where paid staff of the concessionaire is giving touristic information to visitors with the famous waterfalls in back. So all these are different forms of using information, education, guiding um, to manage visitors. Moving on, we have policy and regulation. So here we may have fee structures, right? Both entrance fees or payment fees, different kinds of fees. And then there's fines. Fees kind of allow you to do things and fines are because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. Uh, rules like no food in the parks, local cooperation with stakeholders could be a policy, right? Uh, zoning is also effectively a policy and regulation. Um, having medical rescue and emergency policies set up to protect visitors, putting speed limits on roads, limiting access, reservation systems, staggered or time delayed entrance fees to control visitor flow and hopefully thus impact. The certifications, concessions, and permitting. So not only are you controlling service providers, but in contracts, permits, concessions, and certificates, you oftentimes insert regulations that the concessionaires uh, have to use to control visitors. Um, prohibiting radio and sound equipment, video equipment, like we've mentioned earlier. Setting up friends groups to support the park. Um, increasing ranger patrols, regulations, providing all-terrain wheelchairs as another, uh, another opportunity uh, to help folks out that's not information-based, that's not infrastructure. In the photos in the upper right, you see what happens when there are no regulations about food in parks. You have uh, animal human interactions go up like these coatis. In other places, it can be raccoons. Underneath it, this is from Argentina too, a lot of the parks are outfitted 
with these all-terrain chairs. Um, they both have a wheel or they can be picked up on both sides to carry people across even terrain that wheels won't allow. Of course, it does require at least two people to run them, or at least one if you use the wheel, two if you don't use the wheel. But it's certainly better than uh, your typical wheelchair. Underneath that is a national park in Costa Rica where the Red Cross ambulance is always stationed just in case as a matter of policy. Um, here you have a fine sign in both senses, I suppose. Underneath the fine sign, you see an example of staggered entrances where um, at this national park, Tenorio, only a certain number of people can come in every half an hour. If uh, they've reached their maximum, this is basically a carrying capacity approach, but it is example of policy and regulation. And you can see the people waiting to get in uh, the next entrance period. Right next to that is a sign that says, um, dangerous keep out. Now the sign itself would be information, but the fact that the area has been prohibited from use would be a regulation. So obviously there's an overlap. You need information mechanisms to talk about regulation. Sometimes you need infrastructure like to build a sign um, to would be maybe even a combination of all three, depending on how tightly you wanna use these categories, infrastructure, regulation, and information. And yet another sign that says this is a um, animal crossing, so reduce your velocity. So yes, again, there is there is some overlap, but I think you, you get the idea of increasing intervention. And here we'll stop with infrastructure and physical changes. Hardening sites, um, that's when you make sites and trails more resistant to visitor damage by have, um, choosing harder surfaces like cement or railings, things like that. Security cameras, exhibits and visitor centers, bathrooms. You plant trees for erosion control uh, and shade, such as for a parking lot. Sight and sound barriers, even if they're natural looking, those would be physical um, changes in the landscape. Automated ticket machines, accessible trails, but not just for mobile impaired, but also for seeing, hearing, and language impaired as well. Oftentimes universal trails are not universal at all. They're usually just for people who are, have mobile disabilities and not the other kinds of, and not any other kind of disabilities. People moving technology, horse-drawn carts, buses, trains, are visitor control measures that are physical and infrastructural. Um, separating campsites to increase the isolation experience, as we talked about. There's a whole bunch of different aspects of trails that we can modify. Um, directionality, hardness, width, protective features such as railings, incline, smoothness, uh, the degree to which we allow different kinds of users to use the same trail. Then there's the design of infrastructure to reflect interpretive concept as well, like painting on barrels and elements of the interpretive themes. <laughs> In terms of the photographs on the far right, the tall picture, with the pine tree, this is a, from a sensory trail. And uh, the sign is describing, there's actually a braille there, a little braille plaque for, for blind folks. And at the bottom of that as well, there is a three-dimensional model of the landscape. So that three-dimensional will help visual folks, but also help people who are visually impaired because they can literally feel and touch that earth. So this trail did try to appeal to multiple kinds of disabilities and not just um, mobile disability, like wheelchair accessible. In the, um, the middle, the top, kind of looks like cow patties, but in fact, what you see there are um, steps on a trail that are each of the steps are made to look like the cross section of a tree but they're actually cement and then you can see there's a railing on the left and that railing is also made out of cement so this is a good example of hardening a trail even though using natural motifs underneath that the visitor center uh, in costa rica where they can control visitor flow and offer visitor services underneath that a people moving vehicle in Iguazu National Park. So what we've seen then to recap in this, this lecture, 
is that to achieve sustainable tourism, we need to use uh, good practices. And the demand model is generally not a particularly good practice for destinations, for tourism, for achieving sustainable tourism. One way to control visitors and control tourism growth is to have a, a, vi a detailed vision uh, with specific objectives of desired conditions, ideally proposed by through consensus, community-based consensus. And then using our whole range of different kinds of tools um, that are that increase in intervention intensity from information and education to policy and regulation to infrastructural and landscape changes, physical changes that maintain our desired conditions um, at or below the threshold or the limit of acceptable change so that we create a place that we really want and that is sustainable and hopefully doesn't go into decline because you certainly can imagine and studies have shown that in demand model scenarios by trying to give everything to everybody what you end up doing is hurting the experience for everybody and potentially causing the destination or, or a particular local site to go into decline because the contamination homogenation too many people uh, the original feeling the sensation that we originally that may originally have existed there before tourism has been gone so hope you've enjoyed this and that it makes sense uh, along with the readings and we'll be talking to you very soon um, in the discussion groups.